Okay, um, talking to some of you guys on the break, uh, I just wanted to make sure we were clear on a couple of points um, that I didn't cover, perhaps as well as I could have. Um, we talked about measuring those X, Y, Z coordinates. You know, in your coordinate system, you know, the old algebra, you've got a positive side of the X, you've got a negative side of the X, you've got a negative side of your Y and a positive side of your Y. Y you need to keep those negative signs for your X and Y values in your light position file. So you notice when we get down here, these are the x values. As I cross over the origin and go to the negative sign, I'm keeping that negative value assigned to that. That's so it knows what coordinate you're in. It helps position it. So when you do your measurements, remember what coordinate your flash is located in and keep your positive and negative signs in your light position file. Okay. The other thing is uh, talking here. Uh, I forgot to mention in building your own dome, you know, we were talking about how it can be very simple. This stick model that uh, John had on the, uh, the first presentation at the beginning of yesterday, this is what Malzbender built just to test this. It is literally dowels and hot glue that put it together. So you can see up here is this circle. That's where the camera was positioned. Okay. Each of these triangles down here is simply an opening for a regular handheld flash. You've got, you could run it off a core, but now they've got these uh, radio transmitters that you plug into the top of your camera that'll tell your uh, flash to fire. So you don't need the computer necessarily. All he did was he measured to the approximate center of that location, and he used that for his light position file. So this would be one light position. This would be a second light position a third, so on and so forth. And all he did was hold his large flash like we all use our normal off-camera flash. He just held it at the center of that triangle and tripped the shutter. Then he moved it to the next one and he tripped the shutter. He moved it to the next one and tripped the shutter. So he did that manually using that flash, just using this little stick framework. And that's how he tested this to see if it would work initially. You can do something like this and it works perfectly well. Okay, so that, that's another option for making it, you know, pretty simply. And then your images at that point would be stored onto the camera card, and you just need to download them from the camera card onto your computer to make your PTM file. Okay. Camera selection and testing. This one's going to be kind of dry, I'm sorry. First question you need to ask yourself, what we talked about, is what resolution do you need? We set 35 millimeter film as our benchmark to try and equal. If you don't need that level, then select for a lower level. Again, it's going to be application dependent. Are you predominantly looking at very small objects? Or are you doing something like landscape photography, very big areas that you need to enlarge to poster size? If that's the kind of thing you're talking about, you're going to need a very high resolution camera because once you blow that image up to a very large size, you need all that extra resolution or it's going to start to turn into squares. Again, our application was footwear and tire impressions. So I wound up limiting myself to an object size about 11 by 17 inches in area. That was what I used for my object size to do my line resolution studies. We're, we're not going to run into any footwear impressions bigger than that, I hope. Film or sensor, that's got an effect on your resolution. Um, originally, with film emulsion film, we had the same arguments that we're going through with digital today. You started, you had some 4x5 negative formats. The original stuff was an 8x10 negative format slowly it evolved. They came down to a 35 millimeter size negative format. The very first film that came out was like an ISO 25 speed film. Like, no, 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 that's too small. That's not going to be good enough. The chemistry evolved and it developed to now, okay, well, 100 speed film, that, that's good enough. The black and white is good enough. But the color stuff, it was too grainy. It didn't have enough resolution for footwear impression photography. The chemistry got better. Now we can use ISO 200 speed, 400 speed color film, and that's kind of held, been held as a standard for a number of years. 
some of the 800 speed film that I've seen come out lately has been very good. Um, the grain size is you know, very, very sharp detail when it comes out and I blow them up. So even the 35 millimeter film, there was a question originally of, you know, hey, is it good enough to do this? Because people were used to that large format negative size. We're going through the same thing with digital at this point. The sensors are getting higher megapixel counts. They're getting, you know, the, the density is getting bigger. But what they've done to save on costs of producing these chips is they've again reduced the size of them. The majority of your sensor chips are physically smaller than 35 millimeter film. They express that as a magnification factor. So when you s put a lens on and it says it has a 1.5x factor, that's because that sensor is physically smaller than 35 millimeter film. Your uh, focal length settings, your zoom settings on your lenses are set to a 35 millimeter size. So if you set that lens at 50, the number says 50 on your lens and your sensor has a 1.5 factor, you're actually capturing your image at a 75 millimeter equivalent zoom setting because that sensor has been shrunk. You're basically cropping out the center of the image that the lens is providing and it, and it acts like it's enlarging it. So they've, they've again reduced it. On our, the big, the 16.7 megapixel camera we have, that is what they're calling a full frame sensor. And all that means is the physical size is identical to a piece of 35 millimeter film. It's a larger physical size sensor. There are a number of cameras out there that are using that format. This, uh, the big Canon uh, 1DS Mark II, that is one of them. They also have, uh, I believe it's a 5D that is also utilizing a full frame sensor. Uh, Kodak came out with one uh, that had a full frame sensor. So again, you're, you're talking a larger sensor size is just like in film when you're using a bigger piece of film, bigger negative format. It helps to give you better resolution because your object size relative to that film, it's closer to the size of the film. So the bigger sensor size you have, regard, you know, independent of the megapixel count is gonna help improve your final resolution. Your lens can have an effect on it. You know, quality lenses are going to improve your resolution a little bit. When we tested them, it wasn't a dramatic difference. You could see some minor differences, but really not much. Uh, we, we tested kind of a mid-level uh, lens on up to the best lens that camera, Canon makes. Um, it's called their L-Series. Um, and they're really, like I said, it, you could see it in the numbers a little bit, but there really wasn't much difference. And you also need to think about what your final image is going to be. You know, are you taking general scene photographs where all you're going to do is print out a 3x5 or a 4x6? Or are you going to enlarge these things to poster size? If you're going to enlarge them, you're going to need to go with higher resolution. If you're really just looking at small snapshot type images, then you can get away with less resolution. And how are you going to have them printed? Ultimately, if you run on a black and white dot matrix printer for your images, how high your camera is is not really your limiting factor. You can take your digital images and have them printed out on film, you know, traditional uh, uh, film at, at your local camera center. So that's really the best paper. Um, we did that for the resolution study because we were comparing it to 35 millimeter film. I wanted all the papers to be identical. Um, we have some inkjets, uh, some professional level inkjet printers at, at, at back at the office. We print them on good quality photo paper and they're beautiful. Th they work out very well and we can print 13 by 19 size uh, prints on them and they work out very nicely and I really can't tell the difference between a regular photograph and those. So you know, that's something else you're going to think about. What, what's your final image going to be? If all you're going to do is run them on the screen, you know, your screen's not going to be getting as high a resolution as you can print out on a photo. So, um, I already glossed over this, the physical size of your film or sensor. Your resolution is really relative to that object size. You hear the term one-to-one -one, uh, a lot. You know, I made a one-to-one -one photograph. What that really is referring to is the object to the sensor size. The old lenses had a setting that were one-to-one. -one, and what that meant was that, that res at that setting, that zoom level or that focus setting, your object was actually being transferred to your film plane at a one-to-one size. So if you had a dime, it will physically fit on that film plane sen or sensor. It is being captured at one to one. If you enlarge that to you zoom in with your lens to bigger than that film 
Now you're actually going to maybe a one to two or a higher resolution, but that originally one to one, that's what it meant. Um, I tend to use the term natural size when I blow up because my object is actually larger than I can fit on my sensor. Um, so that's when they're talking about that, that size, that's that relationship of your object to your image. You know, if you have the same resolution film or sensor and you take a picture very close up and fill the frame of something very small, even at the same camera settings, the final image is going to have a much higher resolution than if I photograph this wall and then tried to blow it up using those same settings. So you got to think about what you're taking a picture of and how you frame those images. Um, again, the 35 millimeter film is generally accepted today as having enough resolution for footwear impression. You also got to think about your pixel density. You know, that's that megapixel thing. You know, how many, how many pixels are on that sensor as well as the physical size. Um, I'm aware of Fuji is making what they call a super CCD sensor. It's, uh, they, they touted as having 12.1 million pixels or 12.1 megapixels. It physically actually has about 6.1. They have some extra little small, what they're calling S pixels in between and they're interpolating between those to increase the resolution to 12.1. Uh, so I'm not sure how that really works out on line resolution. We just got one in and I kind of want to look at it. Uh, but just looking at some side-by-side -side images, I can't tell the difference between their 6.1 setting and their 12.1 setting. So, you know, knowing a little bit about the architecture of the chip is going to kind of help you to, to determine if it's going to work for your, your project. There's also uh, something called a Foveon sensor out there now. And what they've done is more like traditional film. Right now you have a pixel and it's got a red, a blue, and a green section and it's going to when it captures them when that light hits it it's going to select one so they're kind of divided into thirds foveon they went hey light different colored light travels different distances in silicone so now what they've done is they've sandwiched them so all the red sensors and i can't remember the order but like the red sensors are in front their green sensors are in the middle and their blue sensors are in the back so the light is going to stop at a certain depth. The red light stops at the red sensor level. The green light stops at the green sensor level, and so on. So their uh, 10 megapixel sensor is really more like maybe a 30, because you actually have three levels sandwiched together. Sigma has got the rights to that sensor currently, uh, so they're making it. But they've actually made that chip even smaller it's like a 1.9 magnification factor, so they've really reduced the size. I'm not, I haven't been able to look at it or play with it. I don't know if it's going to be really good or not. Um, so knowing a little bit about how the chip in that camera works can be important, you know, helping you select a camera, and especially in the resolution. And you know, like I said, the physical size. What's that magnification factor? Nikon typically uses a 1.5. Uh, our Canons are running uh, 1.6, except for the ones that are full frame. Or are you getting a full frame? Um, there's others out there that are 1.8. Uh, there's some that are 1.9. So that, that magnification factor gives you an idea of how small that sensor is compared to 35 millimeter film. What's the quality of manufacturing? When you buy a camera, you want it to last. You, it's going to be out in the elements. You're going to be using it at a, at a scene. Um, some cameras are going to be a little more robust than others, even within the same line. Canon makes some inexpensive cameras that the bodies are not built as tough. They're not as weather resistant. They're more expensive line. They tend to have better seals, keeps the water and the elements out. They're magnesium bodies, stuff like that. Nikon has the same thing. All, all the different camera manufacturers, they, they design their bodies to, to different levels of quality. And uh, what's the focal length of your lens and the quality of your lens? You know, we talked about what, what focal length are you going to use for the distance that you design. So just things to think about when you purchase a camera system. And the final image. You know, what's your print size going to be? Are you going to go to 200% of natural size? Are you going to go to natural size? Are you going to be printing 4x6s? And your printer capability. You know, what, what's that final output going to look like? How we tested this. Um, I tried to keep this really as simple as possible. Um, I went for straight line resolution, and I didn't want to get into, I wanted to eliminate lens effects as much as possible. 
Um, I didn't want to be looking at, you know, pin cushion distortion, barrel distortion, some of those things that lenses can introduce. Um, and I wanted to keep it, like I said, really straightforward. I didn't do any diagonal lines. Um, what I found is that it's called an Edmonds Scientific Resolution Chart. You can order them from Edmonds Scientific. You just go to their website, edmundsscientific.com, uh, I think it is. All it is is a 24 by 36 inch poster. Um, that has the same ratio as 35 millimeter film, that 24 by 36. It has what are called, they're, they're calling their USAF uh, resolution targets. They have multiples on this poster and they go up in diagonals. Uh, they have one right in the center. Uh, they're, they're canted in different directions as they go up in the diagonals and they have them in uh, multiple colors as well. So you could also look at chromatic aberration and some edge effects if you wanted to do that. I limited myself to the center target. I wanted the center of the lens that was going to give me the best resolution possible and hopefully eliminate any lens effects. So that's really what I focused on just to check this. And the, the equation for it, it determines your resolution in line pairs resolved per millimeter. Okay, this is what the chart looks like. So we have this center target and you can see there's multiples going up from this in different colors. I didn't utilize any of those for actually calculating any numbers. The only one I used was this center target. Now how you use this is you fill the frame of your viewfinder with the edges of the poster. And remember this poster is ratioed to be the same as 35 millimeter film. And then you know the focal length that you collected or you captured the image at and you measure the distance from the target to the approximate center of the lens and they uh, provide an equation, which you can't see down here, but it's on the poster, to calculate line pairs resolved per millimeter. After you get your photos developed, you go down here and you see these negative two, two, it's just a group number. And that refers to this, this set of three lines and this set of three lines. So you have both a horizontal and a vertical set of lines. You look at your poster and you start going down like, okay, here I'm at minus two, six. I can still resolve all three of both vertical and horizontal lines. So I'm at that level. I go, okay, well, minus one, one, it's getting a little fuzzy, but they're still clearly resolved. And I get to minus one, minus, or minus one, two. The verticals are clear, but the horizontals are fuzzy. So I'm gonna go to minus one, one. So I look in a chart that's printed on the poster. It tells me how many line pairs that is. Uh, it knows the distance of those line pairs on that chart for that group number. You put it into the equation and it gives you the number of line pairs resolved per millimeter. Okay? And, it, and it's just a number. So what we did, I took these images using 200 and 400 speed film with a 35 millimeter camera using the same lens that we use on the digital cameras because uh, we have Canon, Canon film cameras. And I compared the line resolutions calculated from that center target. We start, I started, the first camera we had was that 16.7 megapixel one. So I went through all the ISO settings. I went through all the uh, JPEG, or three of the JPEG compression settings, uh, one being the most compressed, 10 being the least. We selected one, five, and 10. And also all the file sizes. So we had a small, a medium, and a large file size. Okay, and those equa equated to different megapixel settings. I then also took the 20D after we got it and I photographed it full frame like we're going like we did for the other ones and when I compare that to film that 20D has the same chip architecture as the 1DS but it's physically smaller it's 8.2 it did not meet film when photographing this full poster this 24 by 36 level it was lower than film remember it's the same chip it's 8.2 the 1DS set at 8.4 e is equal to film. So there's that sensor size difference is coming into play and affecting the resolution. So what we decided to do was we're not going to be photographing a 24 by 36 inch area. So I drew, actually drew a line, 11 by 17 area, on this poster. And then I zoomed my frame, I zoomed in to fill the frame of the viewfinder with that 11 by 17 area, and I retook the pictures at that level. Now the line numbers that come out of that are not going to be absolutely accurate because the equation is not set up for that ratio, but it's an apples to apples comparison. 
So I compared, I retook with the uh, 1DS Mark II at what we knew was film resolution equivalency, re-photographed this poster with the 11 by 17, then re-photographed it again with the 20D so we could compare the numbers apples to apples. And we looked at some different uh, lenses as well. Just the cameras we used, the, uh, the film camera, just an EOS Elon, uh, 35 millimeter, and of course the 1DS Mark II, uh, 16.7, the 20D, uh, which has got a 1.6x magnification factor, and it's an 8.2 megapixel sensor. These are the lenses we used. Um, just a uh, regular EF 24 to 85 millimeter lens. This is a pretty standard, standard lens, kind of a middle of the road quality. Uh, we also got a uh, EFS 17 to 85 millimeter lens. This one will only mount on the 20D. They changed the mount on that camera for the lenses, so I cannot put that lens on the 1DS Mark II or the film camera. Now, the lenses that will fit on the film camera and the 1DS can be put on the 20D. So we had just a little limitation with that lens. I could really only test it on the 20D. And then uh, this is an EF, they're 24 to 105 millimeter. This is what they call their L-series lens. It's like the best lens they make. Now I talked about that, that equivalency of zoom settings. I wanted everything set at about 50 millimeters when I did the testing for a, for a focal length because that's you know, about normal eye level. But I've got this magnification thing. So if I set the lens at 50, I would really be taking at 75. So what I did is I set it at a 50 millimeter equivalent. So I went to a lower zoom setting on that 20D to give me an equivalent 50 millimeter zoom setting, okay? We had the uh, photos printed at the photo processing lab, so they're all on the same paper. I originally wanted to go 100% or natural size. However, our photo processing lab with the film, they did not have an enlarger that would go high enough to print that 24 by 36 poster size on the original images. So the biggest they could go was 65% of natural size. So that's what we went through on the study because we wanted to go back to film and that was the largest enlargement we could get from our processing lab. The digital images we can crop and enlarge ourselves and then send the cropped images to the photo processing lab and we could easily get prints that were natural size from them that way, but I was limited by what I could do with the film. Again, edge of the posters filled the frame, although we went to the 11 by 17 area with the 20D. Uh, all of the images we captured for this were in the JPEG format. We did not, I did not do any TIFF, any RAW. I only looked at JPEG because that's what we needed to use for our, the PTM file format. Again, I used four ISO settings, three file sizes settings, and three compression settings for the JPEG images with the 1DS Mark II. Since I'd already done the testing here, I knew what was going to give me the best settings for this uh, 20D. So I went with the ISO setting that was best from this one. It's the same sensor technology. Uh, I, went, I went ahead and did the three file size settings on the 20D, and I used only the highest compression level because I knew that it wasn't making 35 millimeter film originally. So I, I really just went with the highest level that I could on that and then just changed the file size settings on the 20D. Um, oh, one of the things about the, uh, the ISO settings, um, the cameras have different, they call them ISO settings. It's really not the same as film. They use that because it's convenient and, and it is analogous, uh, but it's really a light sensitivity setting. In traditional film, when you go to like an ISO 100, it, it's going to give you a finer grain, but it's less sensitive to light. An 800 film tends to give you more sensitivity to light, but it tends to be a little grainier. I was expecting a similar kind of thing with these sensors. It, it's not the case. The best resolution that I got from these two sensors was actually at an 800 ISO setting. And I was a little surprised. When I contacted the manufacturer, they, they told me, yes, that's actually where we set up our sensors to have the best resolution. So it doesn't really work the same as film. It really has more to do with just that sensor's ability to pick up light. And the way the Canons have them set the 800 ISO setting gave us the best resolution. So for the 20D, I knew the 800 setting was going to be the best. I went with that from the start. 
And then we just compare the results, the 35 millimeter film results to what I got from the uh, 1DS Mark II. And then I compared, since I knew the 1DS Mark II was the equivalent to film at that point, I compared its results to the 20D. And then we, uh, I did what lens comparisons I could do. Bottom line results, the 1DS Mark II, it met or exceeded our film line resolution at several settings. The 20D, we were able to meet the film equivalency, but only at its highest resolution setting and only for an area of 11 by 17 or smaller. If we go beyond that, I'm going to drop below a 35 millimeter film resolution equivalency. Now I found that different lenses will affect the resolution of your captured images. And here's kind of a graphical representation. The two yellow bars on the left, this is the calculated line resolution for 35 millimeter film. Both our 200 and our 400 speed film gave us about the same calculated line resolution. So, you know, under these, the conditions tested, we were able to resolve 41 lines per millimeter. So think about that for a minute. That's 1 41st of a millimeter in thickness. That's pretty fine. Um, at the small file setting, at a compression level of 1, the most compression, the 1DS was able to uh, resolve 30 lines per millimeter. When we got to the medium file setting, at uh, the most compressed, it gave us 42 lines per millimeter. And now you can see I've gone to a, a lower compression and a lower, uh, even the least amount of compression, and that gave us about 47 lines per millimeter. So there was an increase when I reduced the amount of compression on those files. And we went to the large file sizes. Those are those really big images. You can see we actually exceeded film, 35 millimeter film. Another one. Uh, so this is the 20D. These are those full poster images that I did initially compared to the film. These are at the different ISO settings. And you can see film again is at 41. The best I was able to do was 34. So it's pretty close, uh, but it's not quite there. It's seven lines per millimeter less. I, you know, that's pro may not be significant. Uh, but we wanted to make sure we were there. These are um, for the cropped poster area. You notice the line numbers actually have reduced quite a bit. That's because that equation doesn't work well, but we want to look at an apples to apples. So this is the 1DS photographing that 11 by 17 area is the purple. And then the 20D photographing the 11 by 17 area. And essentially, we're about three-tenths of a line per millimeter different between the two cameras. That's the same. I mean, for all practical purposes, there's really no difference at that level. So well, I was confident that at our settings that we were using, we were going to meet 35 millimeter line resolution. This is just a different lens. This is that 24 to 105 lens. So the numbers went up a little bit, um, but not significantly. This is that 1DS Mark II. Uh, this is just showing two different lenses that we were able to put on it. So the 24 to 85 lens and then that L series 24 to 105. Uh, you can see the better lens gave a slightly increased line resolution compared to the, the inexpensive lens. It's not that much though. It's pretty minimal. I don't, I don't know that your eye would see it. And then the 20D, I was able to add that extra lens in. It's the same thing. Um, these are just three lenses. So the 24 to 85, again, is the uh, kind of salmon color. And then the 17 to 85 EFS lens that could only fit on the 20D is this uh, orange color. And then, again, that L series 24 to 105 lens. You can see there's, there's some variation. Interestingly, the, uh, the one lens that I could only test on the 20D gave a slightly better resolution on that particular camera than I was able to get with a really high quality lens on the, the 1DS Mark II. Um, but again, you're only talking four tenths of a line per millimeter. They're, they're effectively the same. So 
you know, like I said, you can see a difference in the lens quality, but it's pretty minimal. I zip through that pretty quick. So with that, you guys have questions on how to do that? I went through it pretty quick. Um, like I said, I didn't try and do this to the nth degree. I just wanted to get an idea of how to test these things and what level we were at with our particular cameras. When you select a camera, I highly recommend that you do this. Um, it only taking the images takes you about five, ten minutes. You simply just tack the poster up to a wall, get a good light source on it, measure it, set up on a tripod, and you can run through all the settings pretty quick and capture your images. Um, it's something to be aware of. You know, what is the limits of the cameras that you're using so that you know, uh, you know, where am I going to pixelate out? Um, so it, it, it's just, it's good to know. And in doing some of these, we've had cameras sent to us that our bureau has purchased, and they just sent them to us. And we're like, oh man, th this is, this is not going to work for scene use because you don't know when we're going to have to take a footwear impression. We need that high resolution. It's not going to make it. Um, so it's just been good information to know at what level camera we need to buy to make sure that we can still make that, that 35 millimeter kind of benchmark. And I'm killing you guys again, aren't I? <laughs> <laughs> so that's really the end of that presentation. Um, do you ever have to check your cameras to make sure all the pixels are functioning? Um, yeah, you're talking about hotspots? Yeah, I, I don't, haven't tested that or checked it per se. If you blow them up, sometimes you can see them. They're, they're just like, they'll, they'll be red on your screen. You'll just see little, little red dots here and there. And what that is is uh, there's, a percent, there's a percentage of bad pixels that camera manufacturers allow. They know they're going to have bad pixels on some of these chips. So as long as it falls below a certain level, they'll let it go. Um, I haven't noticed that being a problem too much, especially with the higher end cameras. You know, you've got sort of your, all the chips are kind of the same. They just put the ones that are really good that don't have very many bad pixels into the higher end cameras. And then the ones that have a lot of bad pixels, they'll just go ahead and put them, you know, into their cheaper cameras. So yeah, it, it's something to be aware of. I, I haven't noticed a real, any dramatic effect with that. I mean, you're talking maybe 10 pixels out of 12 million. <laughs> 